Hello everyone. Uh, yeah, tonight we're um, talking about the Larbiankers again. Because, uh, yeah, there's uh, not enough really <laughs> said about the second night of the like, big killing spree that the Manson family went on. So yeah, that's it. I think it should be closer. It's only better. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's my bigger glasses. <laughs> Does it make me look more clever? Yeah, I'm welcome if you're new, so I do have new subscribers, I've noticed as well. Um, there's a playlist of Charles Manson videos that I've done, uh, talking about the whole case. Because uh, um, uh, people mainly just know about the Cielo Drive crimes, you know, where Sharon Tate died, <coughs> basically. But um, they actually killed loads more people, and they don't want you to um, know about some of these other crimes, because... It exposes what their real motive was because, like, the murder of uh, well, the shooting of Bernard Crow, who didn't actually die but was shot, that's over drug dealing. And Gary Hinman, that was over drug deals as well, sort of thing, you know. So, there's a lot of stuff that they don't want you to sort of look into, really. They only want you to consider those two nights. And no one, um, uh, well, people don't generally talk about the Darby Anchors. And uh, it's kind of glossed over this sort of uh, suggested that these were just innocent people that were randomly selected. But uh, if you look at, you know, the evidence, actually, the Manson family lived at a guy's house. Uh, <coughs> had their black bus parked on the driveway of the house right next door to the Labiancas. And there was possibly a confrontation between Lino and Labianca. In one of my past um, Labianca streams, we talk about that and that sort of thing. And also, uh, last last week, I spoke about Lino Labianca and all the things that was going wrong in his life. He, he had embezzled loads of money from his company and he was actually being fired. That was when they went to uh, the lake uh, to, to avoid the meeting where he was going to be told he was being fired for embezzling all that money and that sort of thing. And he, he had gambling debts and all that sort of thing. So there was lots of uh, stuff that, you know, they, <laughs> they didn't talk about. And also the people, uh, the Labiancas were scared for their lives as well. People, their house was being broken into already, which we're going to get to tonight. Rosemary told people this and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I'll get into reading in a bit. There's quite a lot to read out, so I'll take a break halfway through. Say hello to everyone. Casey's uh, new tonight. You've not, you've, you've not been to a stream before, I don't think, have you, Casey? And Look Mill has been before. But, yeah, because uh, later on we're going to shoot into, we're going to wander off into the weeds a bit because uh, it gets really weird <laughs> talking about the Labiancas, if you're not familiar with uh, all the stuff surrounding the Labiancas and Charles Watson and the boyfriend of... Uh, Rosemary LaBianca's daughter and all that sort of stuff. It gets pretty crazy. We'll get into all that later, though. And uh, oh, and Courtney's here as well. Yeah, <laughs> Courtney's it. That's it. Yeah, we're all just um, like oops. now I'm headbutting the mic. Too close. <coughs> Can you still hear me? Yeah, but like I say, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll get to reading in a minute. Oh. Psyching myself up to do that, yeah. Well, first, I'm going to read about how her kids found her because I found some of the way they behaved a bit strange. Like, I just didn't think about how I'd behave, like, it just seems a bit odd. Oh, thank you. You like my hair? My hair looks good. I'm wearing the same dress I wore last week as well. It's like that. Look at this. Look, the, that's a mushroom in the middle, and it's all birds and like trees and that. And the detail of the cuffs, it's really nice, isn't it? <laughs> <coughs> right, yeah, sorry, I was going to get into it, wasn't I? Uh, this, so this is talking about how uh, the kids acted when they they basically got home and found the bodies, so. Right, prior to the time of occurrence, Lena and Rosemary LaBianca had returned to Los Angeles after a day of boating on Lake Isabella with Susan Struthers, who is the daughter of Mrs. LaBianca from a previous marriage. All three had visited Frank Struthers Jr., Susan's brother, who had been vacationing at Lake Isabella with a friend, Jim Safi, and Jim's mother, uh, Mabia Safi. On August the 10th, 1969, after arriving in Los Angeles, Susan Struthers was immediately driven to her apartment, 4616 Greenwood Place, by the victims and dropped off at approximately 100 hours. Susan's apartment is located in the same neighbourhood as the Lobby Anchors residence. This was the last time that Susan was to see them alive. Following Mr. LaBianca's usual habit, they then drove to the corner of Hillhurst and Franklin, where the LaBiancas had a conversation with a newspaper vendor, John T. Fokianos, 
<laughs> I assume that's how you pronounce it. Sorry if I butchered that. Mr. Fokiano sold them a copy of the Los Angeles Time, Sunday edition, and a racing form, and then drove away. Mr. Fokiano observed no other persons in the vehicle. This was apparently the last time the victims were seen alive. On August the 10th, 1969, at approximately 20 30 hours, Frank Struthers Jr. was driven home from Lake Isabella by the Safi family and dropped off in front of 3301 Waverley Drive, his home. He noticed that the family car, a 1968 Thunderbird, was parked on the street directly west of the house and that the speedboat was still attached to the car. He felt this was irregular because his stepfather, Lino Labianca, never left the car and speedboat out on the street overnight. As Frank walked up the driveway and passed the kitchen windows, he noticed that the window shades were drawn, which was very unusual as he had never seen this done before. He noticed a light on in the kitchen and from habit went to the rear door leading to the kitchen and it was locked. He knocked on the door but there was no response. He noticed his mother's 1955 Thunderbird parked by the garage and the water skis from the boat were laying on top of the fender. <coughs> Excuse me. This indicated to him that his parents arrived home late Saturday night and had taken the skis out of the boat to lessen the risk of theft. They normally would put the boat away the following morning and this had not been done. Frank then went out to the northwest side of the house and found the levered windows open. He called for his mother and stepfather loudly through the window, but still received no response. He became alarmed and frightened and walked several blocks to the Charburger Hamburger stand located on Hyperion Boulevard near Rowena Avenue and attempted to telephone his sister, Susan, uh, through her place of employment, the Great Scott Restaurant. Susan was not working on that particular night and her boss telephoned her at home and gave her the message that Frank was concerned about their parents. <clears throat> Susan telephoned Frank at the Hamburg stand's telephone booth and explained the situation and his concern. After their conversation, Susan telephoned her fiancé, Joseph Dorgan, and requested that he drive her to the Hamburg stand while Frank, where Frank was waiting. Susan arrived at the Hamburg stand with Joseph Dorgan and they picked, up, they picked Frank up and the three of them drove to the LaBianca residence. They arrived at the residence at approximately 22-25 hours and Susan noticed from the outside of the house that the closet light next to the master bed... Uh, the, the closet light to the master bedroom was on and that the kitchen light was also on. They found the keys to the residence in the 55 Thunderbird, a condition which has existed in the past. Mrs. Labianca had a habit of leaving her keys in the ignition of the older car when it was parked to the rear of the house. Frank Struthers unlocked the rear door and he and Joseph Dorgan entered the premises and walked into the kitchen area. They entered the living room area through the kitchen <clears throat> and found Mr. Labianca lying on the floor with something protruding from his stomach. He was lying motionless and they assumed he was dead. At this moment, Susan entered through the rear door and into the kitchen and sensed something was wrong. Joseph Dorgan stopped her from entering the living room and she never saw the body, but did notice some printing on the refrigerator door. Later determined to be helter skelter. Uh, Mr. Dorgan attempted to call the police from the kitchen wall phone, but became alarmed about the possibility of disturbing the scene. All three immediately removed themselves from the premises. They attempted to borrow a neighbour's telephone to notify the police, but the neighbours apparently thought they were pranksters. A neighbour, Dr Mary J Brigham, uh, residing at 3306 Waverley Drive, consented to the use of her telephone, but because of the nervous and flighty condition of all three, Mrs Brigham completed the phone call to the police department, repeating the inf information supplied to her by Joseph Dorgan that somebody had been stabbed. Right, and then they just talks about... The officers being dispatched and all that, <clears throat> basically. But yeah, what I found odd about that was the way they um, uh, didn't, uh, that the Frank Struthers didn't enter the house, uh, that he was uh, af afraid to enter the house straight away. I just thought of how I would behave if it was my house, if I lived with my parents and I got back. I would, I would walk in. I would walk in and continue looking for them. It's, it just seems weird to me that he, he became so alarmed and frightened and ran away before he even went in. And also weird that the neighbour didn't recognise them and thought they were pranksters when they were asking to phone for help because Frank Struthers supposedly lived there and they didn't uh, recognise them. That just seemed odd to me. And that's it. All right, Danny. And shoes is here. Everyone here. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it. Like and subscribe. Make sure I show you today. Should we talk about the lobby anchors? 
<coughs> let's see. Like and subscribe to the video if you haven't already. But yeah, I, and I wanted to mention the kids as well, just so you know for later, uh, to, for what we're going to get to later, so just to keep uh, the, the daughter in your mind. It's quite odd. What ends up happening later. And I just found it's weird that he runs off and phones his sister. When he becomes alarmed and afraid, why go and phone your sister? Why not attempt to get the police straight away? Why not go and investigate further yourself? But apparently, yeah, maybe uh, they, he was so scared. They were so scared that they was going to get attacked that he knew straight away something was really bad. So he didn't. that's why he didn't want to go in. But yeah, it, it just seemed weird to me that he, yeah, why go and phone your sister before you phone the police if, you, if he was that scared? Now I've got to get the second homicide report up. Wait a second. It is weird, isn't it? That's it. He called his sister to make sure certain slaves had cleared out before he went in. Yeah, that's it. Is this us? What have you done? So you get Leslie off the screen. Oh, because I wonder as well. I've always wondered. Well, I'll get to, yeah, because. Uh, I like to present the facts that we know first before we get into discussing theories because, you know, there's a lot of, because we can only speculate. This was all many, many years ago and there's only a couple of people alive who even know the truth. And even they, do they have a clear memory of it because they were also drugged out <laughs> as they did it. I don't think fucking they even have a clear memory of it really. Anyway, right, now I want to read out to you <clears throat> the stuff about Rosemary LaBianca though because it gets uh, like kind of interesting with her. It's believed that Rosemary LaBianca was born in Mexico. She was separated from her parents and resided in an orphanage in Arizona until age 12. And Mrs. Carmen, now deceased, is reported to have been a friend of Rosemary's mother and the Harmon family. Carmen influenced the Harmons to adopt Rosemary and she lived with them in the Fullerton area. She left Fullerton and lived in the San Diego area during the early 1940s. She later moved to Long Beach where she lived with Reba Gage. In 1944, she was employed, employed by Consolidated Steel in Long Beach. While working for this company, she met Henry Martin. Henry Martin, a construction business owner, was interviewed at Parker Centre and will be polygraphed at a later date. Martin supplied officers with the above information on Rosemary's past. He knew Reba Gage as Ione Gage. Don't know if that's how you pronounce that name. Rosemary at the time was using the name Rosemary Harmon. Martin was aware of Rosemary's love affair with Charles Rayder Burge prior to and during the time he, Martin and, Rose, he, Martin and Rosemary were dating. After the war, 1946, Martin supported Rosemary. A short time later, they broke up and Rose, Rosemary began going with Le Burge. Rosemary contacted Martin in 1948 and told him she was pregnant by Le Burge. Martin and Rosemary moved into an apartment and lived as man and wife until Susan Struthers was born. Martin left on business several months after Susan's birth. He later learned that while away in Alaska, Rosemary left their apartment, taking all of the furniture and the new vehicles which were jointly owned. Martin did notify the police because he uh, did did not notify the police because he could afford the loss and was still in love with Rosemary. Among other items taken by Rosemary was a two thousand dollar face value silver dollar collection. Rosemary again contacted Martin in nineteen fifty and asked for forgiveness. Since he was still in love with her, he offered her another apartment which they shared in nineteen fifty one. Martin asked Rosemary to marry him. However, she declined and their friendship ended. Four years ago, in 1965, Rosemary contacted Martin by telephone and informed him she had married Lino LaBianca. She invited him to her home to meet Lino, however Martin declined. Uh, that was the last time he heard from Rosemary. Right. Let's take a break from reading for a second. See, so that's interesting. So she was adopted, basically, and she had a... So like a man who looked after her no matter what she did, basically, even though she went off and she got pregnant by another guy, he looked after her. And she robbed everything they owned together, and he still took her back later. And that's the first mention of this one. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce that name. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, but that's the first mention of this, this lady, and there's a couple of other uh, women that she's associated with. Uh, and all this sort of thing. And like I say, so she's uh, got quite an uh, uh, amazing class. Rosemary LaBianca and this $2,000 coin collection as well because there is a load of coins, isn't there, at the LaBianca house that didn't get taken. And, you know, there was this legendary, really 
Yeah, hello everyone. Sorry, saying hi. Yeah, if you and oh, in, on Facebook, there's this whole thing you've got to click through for me to be able to see your name in the chat through StreamYard. You have to give StreamYard permission to see your name. Basically, it's stupid. But don't worry about it. Sorry, yeah, what are people saying? Yeah. yeah, well, the whole, the whole thing about the Satan slaves as well, well, we'll get to that later, you know, like I say, because um, this is one of the ones where you really have to go off into a weed, the weeds, you know, and like, uh, like uh, theorize because we don't have proof of a lot of stuff, but it just gets quite crazy later. Hmm. Right. Carmen was actually Rosemary's adopted grandmother. Carmen suggested that her daughter in law adopt Rosemary. It's an amazing family story. Oh, wow. Carmen was a friend of her mother. Yeah, yeah, that's what it says. She was in an Arizona orphanage and she was uh, adop adopted from there. And I believe she came from Mexico, yeah. Right, I'll get back to reading <clears throat> the rest of this. Just to take a break halfway through. See what people are saying. Right, so you have to that. Yeah. Uh, four years ago, in 1965, Rosemary contacted Martin by telephone and informed him she had married Lino LaBianca. She invited him to her home to meet Lino, however, Martin declined. That was the last time he heard from Rosemary. Martin supplied investigators with a list of Rosemary's female friends, whom he suspected were lesbians. This list included Ioni Reba Gage, a.k.a. Reba Ski Young, Beatrice Lee, a.k.a. Pudgy, Marty Martin, Charlene Abernathy, a.k.a. Charlie, and Ellen Varney. Although Rosemary showed no evidence of lesbianism, Martin believed that she participated in affairs with I uh, Ioni Gage and others. Is that an L? Now that looks like an L. Lone. <laughs> what? No, no, it's an I in most other spellings. I think it's just misspelled there, sorry. Ellen Varney was contacted in Sacramento. She informed investigators that uh, Ioni Gage was deceased. When questioned about Rosemary's affection towards Ioni Gage, Ellen Varney denied either were involved in that type of love affair. This denial, however, was contradictory to the statements by Frank Martin, Charles LaBerge, Frank Struthers and Jack Minot. Ellen Varney, it appeared, was not truthful with investigators as to Rosemary's and Ioni Gage's affair. This could be due to the fact that she, Varney, now a married woman herself, had been involved with a lesbian, Charlene Abernathy. A personal interview with Alan Varney is planned in the future when investigators are in Sacramento, obtaining statistical information from CT pertaining to suspects. Charles Rayler Burge was interviewed and polygraphed in San Diego. He showed no guilty knowledge of the crime. He reported meeting Rosemary in 1945. He lived with her periodically until 1949. She had a child by La Burge in February 1948, Susan Struthers. He took her to Mexico during this period and they were married. However, the marriage was invalid. Oh. Where was I? And they were married. However, the marriage was invalid as La Burge was legally married to someone else at the time. La Burge claimed he continued to see her until 1959 when he left for Texas. He was gone one year and when he returned wasn't able to locate her as she had married and he couldn't ascertain her newly acquired name. She had their child, Susan Struthers, living with her. He learned of Rosemary's death from Ellen Varney. The Burge admitted he was seeing her during her marriage to Frank Struthers. The Burge believed there was a possibility she was bisexual. She had lived with and had been a close friend of Ski Young, Reba Gage, a lesbian. The Burge claimed he has always been in love with Rosemary. He denied she came to San Diego to visit him and also denied seeing her during her marriage to Lino LaBianca. Frank Struthers Sr. was interviewed and polygraphed at Parker Centre. He showed no guilty knowledge of the crime. He met Rosemary in 1949 while she was a car hop at the Brown Derby Drive-In on Los Feliz Boulevard. He started dating her in 1950 and they were married in 1952. They had one child, Frank Jr., born in 1954. Rosemary's daughter Susan lived with them. They were divorced in 1958. Struthers was not aware that Rosemary was seeing the Burge while they were married. He was aware that she dated Sam Frank, a bartender at the Bell Room where she worked as a waitress. Struthers knew that Rosemary had gone with LaBerge. He also recalled that prior to her marrying him, she was going to marry someone he knew only as Hank, Henry Martin, but she jilted Hank at the last minute. Rosemary also dated an LAPD officer who worked Hollywood division and a Frank Dossett phonetic, so that's possibly not how it's spelled. 
these two people have not been identified. Rosemary was working as a waitress at the Los Feliz Inn when she met and married Lino LaBianca in 1959. She also worked part-time at the Roger Young Auditorium as a waitress. Struthers works as a bartender and has custody of their son, Frank Struthers Jr. Hearsay information is that Struthers expects his son will receive a large sum of money from the LaBianca's death. The Burge is employed as a mail carrier in the San Diego area. He has a part-time job as a producer director of a small acting company. The Burge informed investigators that he once had a conversation with a mutual friend of his and Rosemary's, Jack Minot, and that Minot claimed he had an affair with Rosemary. Jack Arthur Minot was interviewed with his uh, place of business, the AC Paving Company, 2901 Warthen Avenue, Los Angeles, he denied having an affair with Rosemary. He agreed with the Burgess' remarks that she could have been bisexual. He based the possibility on Rosemary's close friendship with Reba Gage. Minot met Rosemary through his, not, through his wife, Sandy. Sandy divorced Minot, remarried, and is now Sandy Gwynn. Minot believes Sandy was a close friend of Rosemary. Sandy has not yet been interviewed. Minot and his wife socialised with Lena and Rosemary between 1962 and 1968. The socialising ceased when Minot divorced Sandy. Minot first met Rosemary in 1946, but never socialised with her until her marriage to La Bianca. Minot and Lino formed a corporation called NYCA Construction Company. This was in 1963, and their address at the time was 174 E Street, possibly Louis Street, Las Vegas, Nevada. Minot was the president of the corporation, and this is discussed in detail under Lino La Bianca. Minot suspected Rosemary was having an affair with Frank Struthers during her marriage to Lino, and Struthers denied this. Martin LeBurge and Struthers described Rosemary as a sexually active woman. Susan Struthers described Rosemary and Lino as sexually conservative. Susan said her parents' bedroom door was always open and she was never aware of them having a sex act. There is the possibility that Rosemary was having an affair, but this has not been verified. Lucille Ellen Larson is the owner of Lucy's Pet Shop, 2524 Hyperion. She claims to be a close friend of Rosemary. She is a friend of Charlene Abernathy, a.k.a. Charlie, a lesbian, who was also a friend of Rosemary. Larson said she and Rosemary had long talked about the problems Rosemary had with Susan. Rosemary supposedly favoured Frank Jr. Larson recalled Rosemary being in the insurance and real estate business. Rosemary played the stock market and had an exclusive interest in commodities. She believed Rosemary's dress shop business was successful. Larson had no idea who killed the Larby anchors. She recalled Rosemary once making the statement, someone is coming into our house while we're away. Larson suggested it might have been the children or their friends. Rosemary said she had questioned them and was satisfied it was not the children or their friends. Larson asked Rosemary how she knew someone was coming into her home. Rosemary replied, things have been gone through and the dogs are in the house when they should be outside or vice versa. This was first mentioned prior to 1968. Uh, there were reported burglaries at the La Bianca residence. Yeah, it is common knowledge that Rosemary left the keys to her car and the house in her Thunderbird, which was usually parked in the rear of the house. Right. So, oh my God, yeah, a lot there. So there's like several different women. But yeah, I just couldn't get over how the, the guy that just kept taking her back no matter what, even when she was pregnant with someone else's child and she lived with him and all that. And she, she just stole everything. She stole all their cars and everything in the, their apartment. And he just didn't call the police. He just let her get away with it. And then gave her another flat later. She must have been quite a woman. <laughs> oh, yes, that's the other thing. The crazy thing is as well, yeah, that, that thing, they, they never identified the cop that she supposedly dated. She dated a Hollywood cop as well. And they never, they never, they never contacted it. They never found who he was. And there was someone else, wasn't there? It says, yeah. Sorry, I just put this on the screen so everyone can see. Ross Mayer actually was a regular in at school and knew Susan very well. She knew Sharon and Raymond and was Paul Fitzgerald's girlfriend. She attended every day of the trials with Paul. Erica and Paul would sometimes let the girls sleep at their apartment during the trials. Well, wow. yeah, I don't know if they ever knew for sure. Yeah, but that's what well, that's what it said, isn't it? Yeah, in the police report, they believe she was born in Mexico, but she was an orphan, so like she didn't like come from a family. And uh, yeah, I had never like uh, actually absorbed that about she she made it in stocks and shares as well. Yeah, it says there, yeah, but she was in the, in that sort of thing. 
<laughs> Great job, Nancy. Well, was, that, was, was that when I scrolled too far and had to go back? I'll edit that out in the in the in the uh, replay. Don't worry. <laughs> but no, yeah, there's a lot there, and uh, what I just I just couldn't go over. It was a different men she dated in that, and yeah, it's it's horrible. You know, she was she said you know all the things that she was saying to them she wouldn't kill the cops and they'd give her anything they should give them anything they want and all that. And she probably would have not called the cops as well would have just but they still fucking killed her. It's horrible. Such an interesting woman and like these people you know don't get enough spoken about them. They were interesting people as well you know. It's just a surf. It's because they weren't famous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> CLO is simple compared to this, yeah. Yeah, like bearing in mind, yeah, all that as well about the kids. This is what I want to get to. I'll, I, I've got to see if I can play this and just react to it without getting any sort of strike. I shouldn't do because it's fair use as long as you're reacting to it. But bearing in mind all that, uh, the weird way... Well, yeah, this is like where we we start to wander off into the weeds a bit because, um, well, I'll show this first because it's really strange that Susan Struthers acts like this. She later becomes Susan LaBerge. But this is the daughter of... Uh, so after she's murdered, uh, you know, her, her mother's been murdered. Well, it tells you how many years later, I think. But yeah, this is like... Uh, it, this is in about 1988. She attends one of uh, Texas parole hearings, so the man who stabbed her mother. And she makes this statement, basically. No, no, I think it will help if I mute my mic. To be out to be with his family. So recently, he appealed to the California Board of Pardons to set him free. And what makes this story even more bizarre is that the woman heading up Watson's parole effort is none other than the daughter of one of his victims, Susan LaBerge, the daughter of Rosemary LaBianca, the woman who on August 9, 1969, was viciously stabbed 42 times by Charles Tex Watson. I am the daughter of Rosemary and Lino LaBianca, and I've written something ahead of time because I wasn't really sure how this would go and, and what I would remember to say. And in this never before seen video, Susan Labarge talks to the California Parole Board, pleading for the release of her parents' killer. I've had much time to think about the crimes Charles committed. They affected me as much as anyone else who loved any of the victims. It has taken time, information, knowledge, and God's love for me to come to the opinion and conclusion that I have reached. I don't think any kind of fear is justifiable for keeping Charles in prison. For Charles, I believe 21 years of imprisonment and his having to live with the memory of what he did is punishment enough. It is my belief that Charles could live in society peacefully and should be given a parole date. But don't tell that to the mother of actress Sharon Tate. To her, any move to... Right, so that's the first part of it anyway. Uh, and she does say more. But that seems pretty fucking wacky, doesn't it? If we were about, yeah, well, this is, this is what we'll get to. It does seem very odd, doesn't it? And we get into like a little series about Joe Joe Dorgan, who Joe Dorgan was. We did text no Joe Dorgan. And all this, but no, there's more to this. I've just I've got to scroll through it now to find the rest of what she says. Has changed, and that he is not the same individual he was 21 years ago. In the past 21 years, Charles' case has continually been placed before the eyes and ears of the public in a very negative way. I feel this has been unfair. I believe if this case is going to continue being viewed by the public, they, they, they the deserve the public to know another side way. of what Charles's life. Murdered seven people they up. should be made aware that he is nothing like the news media has has. Excuse me. 
They should be made aware that he is not rotting away in a prison cell, that he is using productively the time given to him because his death sentence was commuted, and that he is pressing forward to become all that God created him to be. He should have thought about that 20 and a half years ago. Then he would be... Sorry, I don't mean to be disrespectful cutting off Doris Tate there, but I just wanted you to see what Susan LaBurge did, right? Because this is what fuels a lot of the theories about um, Susan LaBurge uh, having known Charles Watson around the time of the murders and uh, this all this stuff about um, Rosemary having money. Uh, and uh, there's also there's rumours that, well, there's loads of, well, Rosemary didn't approve of her relationship with Joe Dorgan. And there's like rumors that Joe Dorgan was a straight Satan, basically one of the one of the biker gang that's associated with the Spahn Ranch as well. And so like they all knew each other. And, and Tex is also supposed to have lived in the same road as Joe Dorgan and Susan Struthers. And so it's been sort of implied maybe um, they they hired uh, Tex and Linda possibly to to do this, or just Tex to do it. And uh, I've I've always had a feeling that it was a, supposed to be a staged robbery because they needed money to pay back Lino's debts or whatever. And it was supposed to just be a robbery and they were supposed to do an insurance job. But for some reason, it, it, it went wrong and they ended up murdering them. But uh, no, but this is like uh, where the crazy theories start. Hmm. Yeah, that's it. I wonder how she feels now that her daughter's been murdered, yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, yeah, her daughter got murdered as well. Yeah, that's another thing. Uh, that I, sh I should have found the articles about that, actually. Yeah, because it's just, I think he hasn't he just been sentenced. It's just finally gone to court, hasn't it? Yeah, but the the daughter of um, the Susan Struthers, Susan Leverge, got murdered by her ex-partner, who, yeah, stalked her down and found her and murdered her, apparently. Broke into her house and stabbed her to death in her bed. Sounds horrible, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it went wrong because Tex likes to stuff. Oh, God, and what they did to Lino and Bianca, it haunts me, it does as well. But yeah, I, I, I wanted to show this slide again, like just to remind you uh, what, what he did to Rosemary Labianca, you know, and, and the, the, this woman, like, um, called for his, I mean, the, the wounds to the front of her body. I think that, that that was probably done by Cranwinkle and possibly Leslie, actually, if you listen to what Leslie said initially in the trial. In her first trial, she did say that she did stab her while she was alive, not just after she was dead. And we can't find the transcripts for where she changes her story at all. That they're not available to us, you know. She had two trials, two more trials, not just one. Because one ended in a mistrial, then she got another trial. And we've never actually, we can't find the transcripts of when it changes to she never stabbed her while she was alive. She only stabbed her after she was dead. Initially, at her first trial, she said she started stabbing her when Cranwinkle started stabbing her. But anyway, Tex, I can believe that Tex did the wounds in her back. Uh, that if you look at the, the wound below her neck, the, like the nearer her shoulder, that's the fatal wound. That wound um, severed her spine, apparently. Yeah, and the, the wounds at the top of her back. If you look at the pictures, I never show the photos on my streams. I don't think it's right to show the photos. But uh, if you if you can find the photos of the crime scene, you can see that she bled from the top wounds, but not the wounds around her, the lower portion of her body. That's so you know they were done after she died because she didn't bleed from them. You don't bleed after you're dead, but she bled from all the wounds at the top of her back. So she was alive when that was done, and she was it, the the way her body was positioned. It looked like she was crawling towards the door. You know what I mean? So this is how horribly he killed her mother, and she still uh, asked for him to be released. But there's evidence there was bad blood between her mother. She didn't like her, you know. Hmm. Sorry, I just started reading the chat there. I got distracted. Yeah, this is the weird thing. I don't know why. Why can't we find the transcript of Leslie saying, no, I didn't stab her while she was um, alive. I only stabbed her after she was dead. They made me do it sort of thing. Because that's not what she said initially, the first time she was... And hers is the only account that we have of what actually happened in the house after Charlie left. We don't know from anyone else who did what. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. 
And so, like, in light of that, uh, you know, how horribly her mother was killed, you would not think that she would go to his parole hearing and call him, and call for him to be released, would you? But she apparently did. Yeah. Yeah, she was down with the cause. I'm trying to help her brother. <laughs> But I always wondered, did she, was that him blackmailing her as well? Yeah, because that's not all she did as well. She didn't only go and make statements at his parole hearings. She apparently uh, got her kid into the same school as Patty Tate's children and got her child a play date with Patty Tate's daughter and all that and was trying to befriend Patty Tate, possibly trying to influence them to get Doris Tate to give Tate a break or whatever, I don't know. But that must have been horrible. Yeah. But for them to find out, you know, that someone connected to Charles Watson was trying to get close to her family, you know, it must have been horrible. And, uh, yeah, but I, I don't – and um, some people say, oh, it's just because she's crazy or she's an idiot or whatever. But I think that suggests that he had something on her. You know, he was blackmailing her. He said, you've got to. Yeah. That's it. She went above, didn't she? Yeah, she went above and beyond to help him out. So I, I think that he was blackmailing her. He was saying, you do these things for me or I'll tell them the truth about why we actually really went and robbed your parents, you know, or whatever, yeah. Or who really told us to go to your parents' house and maybe they were supposed to um, split their money later or whatever. Had they got away with it, they'd have split the inheritance or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and the Black Book. Well, I've heard this about um, Alice LaBianca, uh, Lino's first wife, said that she found the Black Book. But then other people say, there's no, that's not the same Black Book. There's other Black Books as well. So, like, yeah, I don't know about the Black Book thing. Yeah. But that, that that's supposed to be all these mafia contacts, basically, isn't it, in the Black Book? So there's the, the idea that Charlie went in there looking for that. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Texted the stub stabbing. And <laughs> Charlie rob people. That's it. Well, he, and he's supposed to have tied up Lino, isn't he? But Lino was tied really roughly. It was really quite bad the way he was tied. But yeah, I wonder what's. Let me find the the blog post I wanted to read out because there's many theories about um, all this. And I found this. I tried to find out who the author of this is, but I can't find him. I thought he would be in one of our groups, but he's not. Oh, no, I haven't bookmarked it, have I? Don't worry, I'll find it in a minute. I'll edit this out. Out in a minute. But yeah, this is just another hypothesis about because there's many detailed theories about all this stuff about Tex's new Susan Struthers. And Susan Struthers was in a dispute with her mother. Her and her mother had fallen out over her boyfriend. They weren't talking to each other. And she's supposed to have told people she was scared and all this sort of thing. Yeah. Just hours ago, you came across an interview where Manson claimed a little black book reportedly sought after the Larbianca killings actually contained the names of Hollywood music big shots. Ah, right. Yeah. Yeah. She used their bondage rope. They took Jay's bondage rope from the night before, yeah. It's like they had plenty of it. <laughs> yeah. Ah, right. So it wasn't so much the Mafia contacts, it had Hollywood music contacts in it, yeah. Yeah, and also, were they, uh, Lino's supposed to have gone over and had to go at them during a pot party or something, isn't he? So I think he probably just went to domineer him because, like, maybe he, he, he took Charlie, you know, he humiliated Charlie in front of people or whatever. So he just wanted to, rel to relish humiliating him before he walked out. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I've never heard anything connecting him to the music industry before that. That's the thing. Yeah, only horse racing and gambling, which is more like mafia related, isn't it? Yeah, and he's mafia rather than mob because he's Italian and he was in something called the Sons of Italy or whatever. Yeah, some organization. So like he's he's more likely to have been mafia than but, but the mob and the mafia probably overlap, I imagine, don't they? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the gambling is the mafia thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But I just need to say oh sorry, just Achoo! Oh, yeah, sneeze. I just need to take a tiny break quickly. I'll put my be right back loop on and I'll put that music on again.
But yeah, uh, and then I'll read out this this because uh, 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 yeah, uh, the X spot the blog is called, and I couldn't I couldn't find out who the person is. And it's not been updated for about a year, so I don't know what's happened to the person. Hopefully, they're all right. <laughs> Sorry, just another chat now. I've come back. <laughs> Sounds a bit illegal at Columbus Day started in my home. This is the legal fraternal society in front of the mafia. Right, so yeah, so he was he did have a mafia connection. But when uh, if the stream that, uh, the work that I did where I read out stuff about him, they say uh, there's a guy that says there's a couple of guys that say that it might have been mafia related, but then there's another guy that says no, if it was I would have known about it. So like no. <laughs> they said and obviously it wasn't, we know it wasn't, don't we? Or was it? Unless, yeah, they hired them, the Mafia. But why the fuck would the Mafia hire these nut jobs to do it, you know, when they could have had, like, very precise hitmen who would have just gone and put one bullet in him, you know? Oh, uh, I think I found that. I found that on... Um youtube and i've added it to my watch later i'll have to share it in my facebook group yeah there is a documentary and it's got charles manson on, on the thumbnail yeah like a, but it's weird it looks like charles manson wearing a hoodie or something yeah it's some like weird new modern graphic of charles manson called cease to exist yeah sons of italy used to run the southern colorado from senate bar in Pueblo. co a cool place with history it's no bank and they would meet in the vault yeah. Yeah, I haven't watched it yet. Uh, I'll, if I can find, if I see it again, I'll, I'll. I think I've added that to my watch later on in on YouTube. I'll share it in my Facebook group. But I have to, I'll have to watch it. Oh, Eva's and Blino was on the board of directors at the Hollywood Bank, and no mafia money laundering bank. Hmm. Some gin, some gin. No, bloody hell! Now I'm drinking a really a weird drink that Americans have never heard of. Yeah, let's get go with this because this isn't even like the actual brand one. This is like a, an off an off off brand version of it. M Messer Schmidt, right? It's re usually I think called Jägermeister. Jägermeister is the brand name thing. Herbal Schnapps. Americans, it's really weird. It tastes like off. It tastes like cough medicine. If you're a cough medicine liking person, you'll enjoy Messerschmitt. Yeah, sorry, just looking at the chat before I get into reading this out. A mad hypothesis about text. Knowing. Right, that's what Lino, yeah, it wasn't like he was a made mafia person, yeah, he was just a gambler. And like I say, I, I can't see how he was um, able to, you know, get, um, yeah, why he would be worthy of being assassinated by the mafia. I don't think it was, yeah, anything to do with the mafia. I don't believe that the mafia in any way hired them or out like that, yeah. I think if anything, Charlie would have remembered Lino coming out and having a go at him and taking him down a peg or two or something that might be why they decided to target the house and also maybe he knew something about information lino had but how would he i don't know yeah let's read this out and like i say now we're just wandering off into the weeds a bit like i say i, I like to talk about factual things first but yeah the, the point of having all these facts is we can then have like more informed debates about the more wacky stuff here so i go to that and that right hypothesis number four charles watson with the help of susan struthers and joseph dorgan attempted to take over the lucrative hollywood drug franchise by murdering their chief rivals in that market Gary Hinman, Wojtek Fikowski, Jay Sebring, and Struthers' own mum, Rosemary LaBianca. Argument four, the lives of Tex Watson and Rosemary LaBianca intersected at two very critical points. Prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi mentions both in Helter Skelter, but glosses over them. 
First of all, Watson and Rosemary, along with Joe Sebring, at one time or another, earned money in wig-making businesses that cater to clientele in the same general geographic area. You would have expected them to have at least known of each other. Rumours abounded with respect to LaBianca's drug dealing. More substantial uh, sources indicate that Sebring and Fikowski traffic drugs as well. Watson's burn of Bernard Crow, a well-known drug dealer in the Hollywood area, is substantially documented and indicates that Tex had a desire to take over at least Crow's interest in that part of L.A. Watson's incident, Watson's incident with Crow aptly illustrates the nature of Watson's relationship to Manson. In this instance, Watson clearly used his, uh, clearly used Manson to get out of trouble. Uh, hopefully, by taking his talking his way out of it. If not, by killing Crow. As part of his spiel, Manson often told his followers that he would die for them and kill for them, and he expected they would, they would be willing to do the same for him. Watson apparently took Manson up on the offer, perhaps not realising that although Manson talked a big game, little Charlie couldn't bring himself to kill anyone. Manson, perhaps to his own surprise, managed to get off a shot, wounding Crow, not all that seriously, and felling him. But instead of finishing him off with another shot to the head, as any competent killer would have done, Manson leaned over Crow and apologised. Simply put, Watson had the initiative, drive and ruthlessness to attempt to take over LA's most profitable narco route. Still, the former All-American boy needed a lieutenant, someone who knew how the criminal underground worked, and preferably someone who could help him control his criminal henchmen. Manson's ability to mesmerise a bevy of good-looking new bar women, some of them, e.g. Mary Bruner, highly intelligent and well-educated, and his experience with a wider, with a wider assortment of petty crime, from forgery to pimping, made him a perfect sidekick for Watson. In addition to the wig industry, Watson and Rosemary LaBianca had another point of contact. Bugliosi gave a rather detailed account of how Joe Dorgan found the bodies of Lena and Rosemary and rightfully mentioned that he was the boyfriend of Rosemary's daughter, Susan Struthers. Bugliosi failed to mention, however, Dorgan's membership of the Straight Satans motorcycle gang, the same Straight Satans with whom Manson attempted to carry favour, the same Straight, same straight Satans who frequented the Spahn Ranch. Many sources say that the Straight Satans' drug concerns also played a role in the Gary Hinman murder. According to some, they demanded that the Slippies pressure the music teacher into refunding money the gang had given him for what turned out to be a bad batch of designer dope. The Straight Satans could have sold at least some quantities, quantities of drugs. Watson should have known Dorg and quite likely he knew Struthers simply because of their mutual association with the biker. Her support of Watson and his parole attempts over the decades have augmented this perception over the years. Adding more fuel to the fire, Alice Darbianka, Alino's first wife, received a number of threatening phone calls immediately after the murders. The calls told her not to look into any family business, despite the fact that Alice charitably cleaned up the murder scene after the police investigation. According to reporter Bill Nelson, Alice believed that the calls came from Susan Struthers. Believe it or not, Lieutenant Paul LePage, who headed the Labianka investigation team, considered the idea that Dorgan and Struthers played a role in the Labianka's death back in 1969. Bugliosi writes, the tape report listed five suspects, caretaker William Garretson, Herb Wilson, Larry Madigan, Jeffrey Pickett, a.k.a. Pick, and Gerald Jones, all of whom had been eliminated. The LaBianca, the LaBianca report listed 15 that included Frank and Susan Struthers, Joe Dorgan, and numerous others who were never serious suspects. Earlier in Helter Skelter, Bugliosi explained the names Wilson, Madigan, and Pickett were pseudonyms of suspected drug dealers who frequently crashed the lavish parties given by Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate. Subsequent authors, however, weren't nearly so shy in identifying them. Bugliosi gives a clue with respect to one of the dealers' identity by giving him the nickname Pick. His real name was Harrison Pick Dawson, a friend of Billy Doyle, undoubtedly one of the other pseudonyms. Doyle knew Frakowski through their mutual association with Cass Elliott. Like Doyle, Dawson was another drug runner operating out of Canada a fellow criminal whose sour mood would seriously kill a party buzz. As an example of Dawson's sluggish behaviour, Adam Go Rightly wrote, One noteworthy incident that occurred at his housewarming party for 10050 Cielo Drive was a minor brawl involving uninvited friends of Wojtek Fikowski and Abidel, Ab Abigail Folger. Evidently, a 20-year-old man named Harrison Pick Dawson, the son of a prominent State Department official, stepped on the foot of Sharon's agent, William Tennant, which precipitated a shoving match. Others soon joined the skirmish, including two men, also in their 20s, both siding with the aforementioned Mr Dawson. Polanski got pissed off and threw Dawson and his friends out of the party. He rightly further asserted that this Canadian connection planned to use Bukowski as a frontman to introduce the LA 
introduced into LA a drug called methyl, oh god, the MDA. It creates an archaic poison that mimics some of the effects of present-day ecstasy, hence its street name, the love drug. Thus, if Watson and Manson took out Sebring and Fikowski, and perhaps other potential competitors, such as La Bianca and Hinman, they could horn in on the MDA action, having thus an exclusive product for a clientele who could afford any price. That's a powerful motive for murder. The argument against. The most fundamental flaw in this hypothesis is that it requires a validation of the rumours against Rosemary La Bianca. Well, actually, before I read the arguments against, let's go back and see what you've said about that so far. Because I think he's off. This was written a few years ago as well. This was written like quite a long way back. But I, I, I think he's off. I don't think that they went around targeting people because they were trying to take over the drug scene because they weren't taking out the biggest and most powerful drug dealers, were they, in Hollywood? I think they were going around and taking out people who they perceived to have burned them in some way. That's that's what was actually happening. It wasn't that they were trying to take over any. If anything, you know uh, about this, it wasn't it wasn't people that they they were trying to, you know, take over the business of maybe. Yeah. That's it. Linda and Tex had been to the house before. CLO Drive, do you mean, or or the lobby anchors? But it. Well, I think. I'm, when um, they lived, uh, when they had the black bus, Tex wasn't with them. I, I think that it was later, wasn't it, that they meet Tex? Or it might be around that time, actually, when the, when because it's whenever they because they meet Tex at Dennis Wilson's house. Tex is already living at Dennis Wilson's house when they arrive. He meets Dennis Wilson before Charlie. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Jay was like really in debt, wasn't he? Apparently, he was living like way beyond his means. Yeah, and he got ripped off, and he was he wanted to murder the people that had ripped him off. He was saying, didn't he? And all that. But you see, that's that. Well, that's his theory there. And uh, but there's all this stuff about Joe Dorgan. Well, I've heard people say that um, Joe Dorgan wasn't a patched member of the Straight Satans. He was a friend of the Straight Satans. But being a friend of actually is not nothing. That's actually, that means you're allowed to use their clubhouses and you're allowed to ask favours of them and you, they're given permission to do certain things in certain areas and shit like that. So being a friend of the Straight Satans isn't nothing. And it might have meant that he would be in the clubhouses. So if the people from the Spahn Ranch were going into the clubhouses of the Straight Satans, they might have met Joe Dorgan and all that sort of shit. And apparently Tex is supposed to have lived on the same street as uh, Joe Dorgan and Susan Struthers at one point. And like I say, I always suspected that maybe uh, even because the dogs never barked and the dogs did bark at strangers. And during all this, the dogs never barked at all. So I, I wondered if there was meant to be a stage robbery. And so Rosemary and Lino did uh, let them in and and consented, you know, they consented to like uh, be tied up. But they only got around to tying up Lino before it started to go wrong and Rosemary realised something was up. And that's when they start fighting. But I wonder if that's why there was no sign of a struggle and they didn't have to like really strong arm their way in. Because it was meant to be like a stage robbery. They were meant to tie them up and steal some stuff and then it just leaves them to be found by Frank later. But it, it goes wrong and they end up murdering them. Also that. But then the other theory is, yeah, that bloody Susan hired them. Uh, because she was going to inherit uh, stuff when Rosemary died, basically. And she's supposed to have been in a dispute with her mother and not liked her mother, isn't she? Hmm. So, so, yeah, I'll read out his armies, uh, what his uh, arguments against. So I'll just see what everyone else is. Yeah, people say that he didn't. He didn't in the months he he died. He got ripped off, didn't he, for money? And I wonder if that's why Sharon was hanging around as well, because uh, Sebring had had money off her dad. Her dad had given Sebring money for his company, and was she hanging around to go to fucking come on, Jay? Where's this money? My dad's going to ask where your money, where his money got invested. He wants to see a return. Is that why she was like fucking hanging around and watching what Jay was doing, because he had blown all the bloody money that the dad had. 
given. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I don't believe that they were big time enough. Yeah, because that's his hypothesis is that they were trying to overthrow the big time dealer so they could take over the market. But it's like, no, they weren't big time dealers, though. That's the thing. They were they they might have all been dealers. I can believe that, yeah, obviously. With J C bring there's tons of there's no like uh, evidence of him being arrested for drug dealing. That's the thing. Yeah, Rush used to point that out years ago, yeah, but he was never busted for drug dealing. But there's lots of anecdotal evidence that Jay Sebring was a cocaine dealer. And Wojtek, we've got everything that's in the police report about him importing the MDA. And also the FBI report about Roman Polanski sending dangerous drugs. So they were drug dealers, yeah, but they weren't big. They weren't big drug dealers, yeah. That's it. So it's like, no, I think he's a bit he's a bit off by saying, no, they were trying to overthrow these drug dealers so they could take over. I think they were going around after people that had burned them in some way. So what the hell had Rosemary LaBianca done? Maybe it was something over, the, over when he had a wig shop, even. So it could have been something as petty as that. They were desperate for money, weren't they? They knew she had money, maybe. And that, that it could be something as easy, as simple as that, couldn't it? Because this, this is why they went after Gary Hinman. They thought he had got some money. Uh, but it was just his dad had given him money to pay for the tickets for his thing to Japan, and he'd already spent the money. He didn't have the cash, but I think they had possibly heard about that him getting that money from his parents. But he didn't even have it when they went round there to try and fucking strong arm him for it, did they? That's the tragic thing. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah, I know. That's the thing. That sort of shit shouldn't be on YouTube as well, should it? Also, that the Hendrickson documentary, you see Grogan with a little girl on his lap. Oh, God, it's horrible. No, it is. Yeah. And he's the one they let out. Of all the of all of them that have been that have been the fucking none of them have ever been released, but Clem, and he's the one that you see footage of all over little girls, and he was he was arrested for uh, having a hole in his trousers, and you could see his dick through it in front of kids, school kids, in it or something. Yeah, God, and he's the one that got released. <laughs> mm. Yeah, who knows? I'd like to know that as well. Yeah, where is the evidence that he knew the straight zones? Like, who who is there that can back that up? Because anyone, anyone could say that, couldn't they? That's the thing. Well, I'll, I'll read out the arguments against now, yeah, because I think I've seen everything. In the chat. Sorry, let me get back to the page. Argument against. The most fundamental flaw in this hypothesis is that it requires a validation of the rumours against Rosemary LaBianca. Gossip is often malicious and defamatory, and threatening behaviour by Susan Struthers is attested by journalist Bill Nelson. Ah, that's where that comes from. Bill Nelson. And Lino's first wife, Alice LaBianca. Right, so yeah, and Alice LaBianca said that Susan Struthers was threatening her as well. Doesn't necessarily indicate that Struthers had any involvement. For all we know, Alice could have misunderstood Susan's grief-stricken actions and then reinterpreted them in hindsight. Yeah, and also, like, all teenagers fall out with their mother as well, doesn't it? It doesn't mean that they, she had her killed. <laughs> Without evidence of Rosemary LaBianca's complicity in drug sales, this entire thesis falls apart. And that's the problem, because there is no evidence... We have. I've heard people say it's in the FBI report. It's actually not. It's not. I've read through the FBI report loads of times. It doesn't. There's no actual in any of the reports any evidence of Rosemary LaBianca selling drugs. According to this story, Susan Struthers participated in the murder of her mum and stepfather in order to help her boyfriend and his friends Watson and Manson expand their business. And I think Manson shouldn't be included in this as well because I don't think Manson gave a shit about anything Tex was doing while eliminating the competition from Rosemary. But if Rosemary didn't traffic drugs, then Struthers would have no reason at all to help anyone murder her mum, and thus no motive to murder her dad. Without the drug angle, there's really nothing much to link the lobby anchors to Sharon Tate and her friends, other than Rosemary and Sebring's mutual interest in wigs. Because of the similarities in their modus operandi, one would expect the motive for uh, one round of murders was at, least to close, was at least close to that of the second round. If you can't prove drug sales as a motive for one, then it's difficult to prove this as an underlying motive. 
a minor point, but one to bring up is if there's an is there were an obscenely lucrative drug test for over solely by a hairdresser, a wannabe filmmaker, a waitress turned businesswoman, and an incompetent wig maker, wouldn't the mafia have already had that market sewn up? Wouldn't it just be that easy for them to control with no middle persons? So yeah, like he he debunks his own thing there as well because like I say I don't think that he the the the, the motive was trying to take over anything I think they were desperate to fucking help out their friends who were fucking getting nicked all over the place for murder because Susan was implicated in in the Gary Hinman thing as well weren't you so Susan was going down so they were just running around frantically trying to get help for their friends weren't they yeah Rosemary wanted to essentially freeze Luna's assets along with wiping away certain underworld debts. Susan, along with Tex, turned the tables on Rosemary, therefore thanking all of the money. Taking all of the money? Did you mean to? It was like predictive text going on. Sorry, just looking at the chat now. Danny Newcastle's Canadians as expats running in the same circles. Yeah, well, it is weird how they all... Uh, but, but Pick Dawson, she appears to have met from stage school. So I think it's Pick Dawson is how she ended up meeting all of them. Mm. And they're all drug dealers and wanted to access people from Hollywood. And she had a house right in the middle of Hollywood, didn't she? And was really friendly to everyone and threw massive parties. So perfect person for them to all lag on to. La Bianca murder still appears to be a double cross of Rosemary. And he knows going to face his mother on the Gateway Board of Directors on Monday morning. I've heard that the meeting was actually on the Saturday that they went to the lake to, to avoid it. So that he just got fired without being present. As well. Uh. Yeah, that's it with all of Jay's Rat Pack connections and clientele. Well, apparently he had pissed off Frank Sinatra in some way, hadn't he? He he, he was in debt to everyone. Because I've heard that when he got killed, Frank Sinatra rang around asking if it was them that had done it because <laughs> he was in debt to so many people. And all that kind of stuff. Well, we've been going over an hour now. Yeah. Sorry, just looking at the thing. Joe just had the elite group he was selling to. Yeah, well, he, it was mainly movie stars, people whose hair he cut, wasn't it? That's why he was encouraging them to grow out their hair and have it cut with scissors. That gives them an excuse to <laughs> go and meet them, doesn't it? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there was a he had big time clients and it would have embarrassed a lot of people, wouldn't it? Had it come out at the time. Because people were more conservative then. It damaged people's careers if they was associated with drugs. Nowadays it doesn't matter, does it? People get exposed for taking drugs and they go to rehab and fucking everyone forgives them and everyone moves on, but back then it ruined your career, didn't it, if you was associated with that sort of shit. Yeah. So do you think he knew the dumpster diving ladies? Yeah, because that's it. Because uh, they, 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 this is another thing. They think that the girls must have met Lino because uh, they used to go around taking food from the dumpsters, didn't they, of the supermarkets? And I've had there's a, there's a rumor that they used to give him blowjobs to be able to take stuff from the dumpsters, but I don't think that that's true. I think that's just something that's fucking made up. That's ridiculous. Why would you give a man a blowjob to take stuff from the dumpsters? Just make him give you a fucking nice joint of beef or something out of the chiller section. If you're going to suck his... My God. Yeah. She was selling the cocaine roots on it. Yeah, he has to wash the hair with. Yeah.
Dear me. Got to the end. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, before I wrap up as well, I've seen in the Buy Me a Coffee page, I've got a wish list now. And don't forget my Facebook group as well. Uh, need to get more discussion going in there. I want to get up to 100 members. We're nearly up to 100 members in there. It's linked from the channel page. If you go to the channel page, True, or just search True Crime and Moonshine on Facebook. You can find the group. We're talking there. On the Buy Me A Coffee page, I've set up a wish list. Because, uh, yeah, I want to totally... Um, I want to get rid of my sofa and I'm trying to save up to get a recliner chair. And I'm going to actually use the page to <laughs> save up for it myself. I'm going to pay money into it. But, yeah, you can help donate me uh, money to get this chair that I want. And I said, I'm going to get rid of this sofa altogether. And I want a camera. Because at the moment, I'm just using the camera on my laptop. I want a camera that's going to be like further away. And so I'll be looking down to the laptop and not straight at it. It'll be, be brilliant. Yeah. And my life. Um, yeah. I've been. Oh, God. Yeah. Just in my, life, I've, my job's been really getting me down. I have to travel to another town every day to fucking work. I clean a school uh, on, on weekdays. And that's been really getting me down. But I finally got a job in my hometown cleaning my old high school. Ironically, yeah, I'm going to go back to clean the school that I went to. So it's not the same buildings anymore. The whole thing's been knocked down and rebuilt. <laughs> but the school that I went to originally, back when I was a teenager. But yeah, I need to fucking get rid of this sofa. And it would, it'll make the, the whole set look better. When we go to the after stream, I'll get more into that. But yeah, uh, uh, the buy me a coffee link. Uh, obviously, yeah, thank you to everyone who donates. If just a couple of people donate every month, it helps to uh, cover the cost of StreamYard and Canva. But yeah, if you want to support the channel, there's other ways you can help now. I've got a wish list up. Oh, God. And all that's on it at the moment is the recliner chair that I need to get and a camera that I'm trying to get. And... Uh, yeah, that's it. The Kindle version of the Acid King book, because uh, I want to do a thing about um, uh, Ricky Case, the Acid King. But there's a lot to read about him, because that's another case where they've told a lot of bullshit about it. And it's been exploited, and it's it's actually quite tragic, because the, the truth behind it all is just quite tragic, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, it has been really good. Uh, in fact, that's yeah, I've, this is a really big audience actually. We've got 40 people watching. I rarely have that many people watching. Thank you for coming, everyone. Yeah, and I see we've all been active in the chat. And like I say, um, check out the playlist of all the Charles Manson videos I've done and join my Facebook group. Or if you're in Manson Family Mystique, I'm in there as well. I used to be a moderator in, in Mystique, but something fucking weird happened. I got unmoderated and Mike can't remod me. But yeah, I'm in I'm in Mystique as well. And I've got my own Facebook group, True Crime and Moonshine. But I, I just want to talk about historic true crime. I'm gonna go I'm gonna talk about um well oh, pardon me. So when I did the uh, Max Jacobson stream, a woman called uh, Mary Pinochet Meyer, her her murder came up. And uh the way they, they gloss over it quite a bit in the books, they just say that she was murdered because she was a lover of JFK and she might have pillow talked with him. I thought, what? Well, that's a bit heavy that they killed her just because she might have heard something. But it looks like there's a bit more to it than that. She was a social reformist as well, so they were worried he was she was going to continue JFK's legacy or whatever, you know. So there's a bit more to it than that. But she was murdered. Yeah, and the Ricky the Ricky Caso case is really sad because I I feel for them because I was a teen I I was a teenager from you know, like a shit town and saw a lot of people fall into drug abuse and shit going badly wrong and all this sort of thing. And, we never got hit with PCP. PCP is a fucking crazy drug. That's what they were all doing when it got to the point where they murdered each other. You know what I mean? And as I'm reading about it as well, they never went after the dealers who was fucking giving these kids these drugs. You know, they blamed the kids. They were victims of... He was 13 years old and he had so much weed he could give it away to his friends. But then if they wanted more, they had to go and meet the man behind the library to buy it. So whoever this dealer was, was working like the fucking devil. You know what I mean? Giving a kid enough weed to... And, and then it, it went on to... They moved on to other drugs. And they're blaming him. They make him look like a demon. That's it. They fucking... They, they, they paraded him and made him look like an absolute psycho, didn't they? He was, he was a kid that was being fed all these fucking drugs. And they treated him like that. It's tragic. 
Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, Murray's Mosaic. Yeah, I've got that. It's on archive.org. Shit, yeah, and I've, I've just pinned that as a pinned post in my Facebook group. There's a petition to sign for archive.org because the, the, the courts have decided that they're breaking copyright laws by sharing the books the way they are. So hopefully that, that stays up because I use that a lot. Mary's Mosaic is the book about Mary Pinochet Maya, by the way, who I was talking about. Yeah, I've got it favorited and I've got to read it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And it, and it's a dissociative drug as well, isn't it? I, I want to do a better video then because it's in the in the Charles Watson's Belladonna trip thing. I tell you, I tell you all about the different types of hallucinogens and what they do, and how, how some of them are worse than others. And PCP is one of the bad ones. It's one of the fucking dissociative ones that puts you in another fucking makes you feel like you're outside your body and all that sort of shit. It's not just like taking acid or mushrooms. It's worse, yeah. And he apparently stole the. And yeah, that's the other thing that they talk about that they don't tell you. But the, the kid that got killed had stolen. Ricky Caso had fallen asleep at a party. And the other kid had stolen PCP wraps out of his pocket and had never fully paid him back for it. And then he went out to this, like, you know, deserted bit of the woods where they went to do drugs together with Ricky Caso. And so it probably, it sounds like they were probably just supposed to beat him up, but it, it got, they got carried away. But it's another drug crime, basically. It's not, it was nothing to do with Satanism. And they did the satanic panic made it sound like it was all fucking Satanism, but it wasn't. It was just more horrible drug murders. And did they ever go after the drug dealers that gave these kids the drugs? You know, fucking doesn't sound like they did. Yeah, PCP was around a lot. Yeah. Angel dust is what they call it. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. You get the mad strength and psychosis. Yeah, that's that's the other thing. Yeah, getting back to the Labiancas. Yeah, yeah, but that's it. I wonder why they didn't steal more. I've always said that, but other people have said, "Oh, well, you know." But they, they they won't be that smart. That's it. Yeah, because we're we're told, aren't we, that they're running around trying to get money for Bobby? But there was a lot more shit they could have taken, if that is true. And guns as well. There was guns and bullets if they was preparing for a fucking race war because they're just... Uh, no, the raid doesn't happen until after, does it? Yeah, so yeah, but they were collecting guns. You'd think they'd have tried to take some more guns, wouldn't you? Because there was guns at the house. They didn't take anything. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, PCP is not like acid. In the, in the text Watson video, I read out an article where I explained the different types of hallucinogens, but now I know how to do the Canva presentations. I'll try and do a more dynamic presentation on what all the different types of hallucinogens are and that yeah that's it well there's there's this thing if he had been on pcp but fucking there's this thing called stp right and uh leslie says in her trial the bit that it's read out i've got um i read it out in the original leslie stream that i did and i've done a clip of it uh but she says that tex might have been on this drug stp which is a mixture of LSD and amphetamines, basically, and strong, stronger LSD than a normal dose. So it's still not quite the same as PCP. PCP is even worse because PCP is a dissociative hallucinogen. It's fucking like like uh, the belladonna, where it's actually jimson weed or um, whatever you call it. Oh, I can't see other Datura. Nowadays, the kids are calling it Datura. The drug is called Datura. Well, the plant is called Datura. But my warning to anyone who wants to try and take it is fucking don't. It's poison. It's literally fucking poison. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the Mary Myers uh, story. I, I want to look into it as well because she's supposed to have taken acid with JFK. But she felt passionately the same way he did about politics because he was all about social reform, wasn't he? And making society better for everyone and all that. And so maybe it wasn't just because... STP has just been now. There's LSD with it as well. Apparently, it was mixed with LSD. Yeah, and like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah, this is a big audience. In fact, because we've been going for one hour twenty six minutes, and I've said most of what I want to say, I'm probably going to stop and go to an after stream in a minute. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Mary Myers, and was it with Leary as well? I think no, it would have been too early, wouldn't it, to be Leary? Because it wasn't until later in the 60s that he had his thing. But yeah, they they had done they did LSD therapy together or some shit, didn't they? Yeah, they had taken LSD with each other. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so because I need to go. 
I'm stretching my legs again anyway. So I'll end this now and I'll come back for an after stream. But yes, don't forget to um, join the Facebook group if you haven't already. And like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And also um, all the streams, because I take them down just after I've done them. They're always left up in the Facebook group. I never take any streams down. I sometimes take the after stream down if it was just particularly boring or if someone appeared on it and I promised them I'd take it down. But usually all the streams are just left up in their unedited form. But on YouTube, I take them down so I can edit them. And I only ever cut out like annoying pauses and stuff like that. I've never like really chopped out anything incriminating or anything. Excellent. Yep, so thanks. I'll be back in about five minutes anyway. But I'll end this stream now. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's an interesting one, isn't it? And it's good. Yeah, thank you for coming, everyone. It's been interesting in the chat. And like I say, join the group and look at the Charles Manson playlist I've done. Because you have to understand the whole sequence of events to understand how it escalated to the point where they did this to the Labiancas and Sharon Tate and all that. You know what I mean? Excellent. Yes. Anyway, I'll end I'll end this now, but in give me five minutes and I'll come back on for an after show. Okay. Thanks for coming everyone.